For those of you that joined me the last time, um, you know that James K. Polk is going to win the election of 1844, and one of the things is he's going to promise is to add more territory to the United States. This was a very populist thing to do, considering opening up new territories to working class white people uh, came across very pro middle class. The problem is, this is going to have some unanticipated consequences, and as I hinted around at the last time we met, a lot of this has to do with international relations and, uh, in particular, our relationship with Mexico. In 1845, one of the first acts of the, um, of the president, President Polk, would be to add, te uh, add Texas into the country. Um, but the problem with this is, on the one hand, this is only going to whet Polk's appetite for more territory. He had been eyeballing what you and I call the southwestern part of the United States for quite some time now. Um, he actually had reached out to buy California from, from, from Mexico. It was, it was Mexican territory. Um, Mex Mexico refused primarily because we were not in a very good place with them, um, primarily because we recognized the Republic of Texas shortly after the war. Um, what that means is if you want that territory and they're not willing to sell sell it to you then really the only thing left to do is to conquer it and it's actually texas that gives polk exactly that opportunity there was as i pointed out the last time disputed territory in terms of what was mexican land and what was uh texas and texans proclaimed that it went as far down as the rio grande river Mexico assumed that it was the Nuasis River, and so you've got this territory that's essentially no man's land. It's claimed by both sides. And Polk, he, he plays this as if he's protecting Texas's sovereignty by moving troops south of the Nuasis River. The problem with that is that Mexico sees that as an invasion, and they fire upon those troops. They kill uh, almost a dozen of them. Polk takes this development to Congress, and he says... American blood has been spilled on American soil, and so therefore, I want your congressional approval to defend it. I, I want you to declare war, and they do. It leads to what you and I call the U.S.-Mexican War. It begins in 1846, and it will last into 1848. It doesn't even last a full two years. It's going to be short, and it's going to be very decisive. America's going to win this thing, and it's going to win it very much hands down. And part of the reason for that um, is that Mexico never really recovered economically or even militarily from the Texas Revolution. In any case, what the treaty that ends the war is going to do is it's going to completely reshuffle the map once again. Okay, The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, what that does is it ends the war and forces Mexico to give up what at the time was their, their northern frontier. I mean California, of course, but I also mean Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, Utah, a chunk of Colorado, what you and I call the southwestern part of the United States. The United States acquires that through conquest. Okay, What it does from the people that were living there before the war ended is probably even more important. What Mexico wants to know is what will happen to those individuals that were essentially Mexican nationals before the war broke out. What do you plan on doing with them in the aftermath of all of this? And the treaty's answer is pretty simple. As long as they stay put for one year, they would become members of the United States. They'd become citizens. It was a big deal, considering not everybody got a citizenship card. But for right now, I need you to understand how the end of the war was seen back in the East. In places like Georgia, South Carolina, it was seen as open season on Mexican territory. And uh, the first come, first serve when it comes to going out there and laying out your plot. Now, um, what happens thereafter is you get these Anglo squatters that are coming to the Southwest. And the only way that these former Mexican nationals, now Mexican Americans, have to get them off is to take them to court. If you've ever had to go to court, you can tell me that there's nothing cheap about it. It's, it's an expensive process. And although the, some of these people are rich by the standards that they own a lot of land, they don't exactly have a lot of liquid cash lying around. What that means is that they're going to begin parceling out their land to settle those legal debts. Whether by hook or by crook, what you're seeing through the Treaty of Guadalupe 
um, you are seeing the erosion of a Mexican-American landowning class. And because many of these people are farmers, they're going to be in a very desperate situation um, not very long down the road. And when the railroad companies come to town, when the mining companies come to town, and they, they, they're they looking for a very cheap, docile, easy-to-manipulate workforce, they find one in these former Mexican-American landowners because there's really no other options for them once the land went away. If you study history long enough, you, you'll come to the realization that when it comes to inequality, nothing is really random or accidental. There's generally a domino cause and effect sort of dynamic to this, and certainly there is when it comes to inequality in a southwestern context. What's even most important is how the end of the war was seen back in Washington, D.C. In Pennsylvania, there's a congressman by the name of David Wilmot. He's from Pennsylvania, and he introduces a, 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 an idea that comes to be known as the Wilmot Proviso, and it proclaims that any territory that we acquired through war with Mexico would be off limits when it comes to slavery. New Mexico, for example, would, would not be allowed to have slavery, it could only enter the country as a free state. This is going to run into problems when it comes to the Senate because you have a perfectly even balance of power in the Senate, um, two senators per state, and so it's 50-50. But even if it wasn't 50-50, there are northern senators that have interest in expanding slavery. There are other northern senators that had a favor done for them and they need to pay that favor back. And so my point is the Wilmot Proviso goes down in defeat when it reaches the halls of the Senate. The defeat of the Proviso is going to lead some to charge of a slave power conspiracy. This is actually very simple. A slave power conspiracy insinuated that there was some sort of unholy alliance between slave owners and the U.S. government. What the U.S. government is essentially doing was working on behalf of slave owners to expand slavery as far and as wide as possible. What this is going to lead to is the creation of a new political organization that comes to be known as the Free Soil Party. The central platform of the Free Soil Party is no expansion of slavery. You can keep it in Georgia, you can keep it in Tennessee, where it presently exists, you just cannot expand it into those western territories. I want to make something clear. This is not a moral issue. Most of these people that are going to come to be known as Free Soil Politicians card-carrying members of the party, they're not really concerned with the immorality of slavery. They just want to preserve opportunity for white Americans, and you do that by limiting where slavery can go. My point is that it's entirely possible to be anti-slavery and not give a hoot about what happens to African Americans all in the same individual. But in 1848, the Free Soil Party is going to run in their first ever presidential election, and they're not going to do too bad right? Much to the chagrin of the Democratic Party. Speaking of the Democrats, if you're a Democrat, you don't want to run somebody from the Deep South, given the fact that people are openly tossing around this idea of a slave power conspiracy. If at all possible, you want to run somebody who is not a slave owner, preferably from the North. They find a guy from Michigan by the name of Lewis Cass. Lewis Cass is a northern Democrat, which makes him advantageous, but what makes him even better is that he essentially is able to talk out of both sides of his mouth. He said it ought to be up to the people of Arizona. If they want slavery, let them vote on it. If they don't want it, then they'll vote it down, right? More of that in a minute. The Whigs are going to nominate the war hero of the U.S.-Mexican War, a guy by the name of Zachary Taylor, who's from Louisiana, and he's actually a slave owner, right? The Free Soil Party is going to nominate the one-time Democratic president, Martin Van Buren. So do the math. You've got two Democrats, right? Because although Van Buren is running on the Free Soil Party, everybody knows him as a Democrat. They're going to split their votes, which will pave the way to victory for um, Taylor. The Whigs are essentially a minority party, but as you can see, slavery is splintering the Democratic Party. Taylor's election also means that this issue of slavery is not going to go resolved, at least for the next four years. And you're also going to see a controversy coming to bear in California. By 1850, people in California were pressing very hard for statehood. 
and uh, Taylor, as president, actually encourages him to draft a constitution as a free state. Why? Um, it, it's pretty much common knowledge that cotton is not going to grow in California. And so anybody that's paying attention knows that slavery doesn't make any sense in California. So this is how and why Taylor is actively encouraging California to come in as a free state. But the problem with this is that is making people go crazy in the South. It's upsetting the balance of power. That's the problem. If California comes in, it's going to now have a two-senator advantage when it comes to national politics. And that's not something that people in places like South Carolina are willing to accept. So what you're going to see here, guys, is another one of our patented compromises. And none other than our good friend Henry Clay is going to come and he's going to design this great compromise of 1850. I'll explain why this is important here for a second. But for right now, I just need you to know that this is three important parts to it. Part number one is that it does bring California into the country as a free state. That's something that the North likes, right? To make the South happy, we get a very draconian, very harsh anti-runaway slave law called the Fugitive Slave Act. I'll come back to that in a minute. Lastly, it says that the rest of that territory out there in the Southwest would be determined based on popular majorities vote for, vote against slavery, it's ultimately your call. The Compromise of 1850 is, again, important, similar to the Missouri Compromise 30 years earlier, because in 1850, it's still very questionable as to whether or not the United States, as a political entity, can survive a civil war. You don't know. Obviously, we'll never know, because the Civil War is prevented in 1850. Now, it's not nearly as successful as the Missouri Compromise was, but it does prevent the war for another 10 years, okay? Now, I want to say this about the Compromise of 1850 before I let you go. Nobody was happy with it. This, this was seen as a really big problem, both North and South, but especially from the perspective of the North. The Fugitive Slave Act, you have to understand what this law did. What this law said was that it was essentially illegal to harbor runaway slaves. If you knew of somebody, you must report them. You had to comply with efforts to bring them back to slavery. Like it or not, it was federal law. Maybe a better way of looking at this is what it's allowing slave catchers to do all around the North. Slave catchers, which I told you was a big business, Slave catchers basically invade the North. They invade hotbeds of abolition activity, places like Rochester, New York, Madison, Wisconsin. Only this time, they're flanked. They're assisted by U.S. federal marshals. Badges on their chests, right? You can now knock on someone's door, and you can say, I got a hunch that you've got slaves in there, and I'm coming in. I've got a U.S. marshal right here behind me. This is a radical expansion of federal power. It's quite ironic that the South, which had long been suspicious of centralized federal power, long been obsessed with a law that would come out that would make their institution of slavery illegal, has now basically just shredded the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment, if you recall, guards against illegal searches and seizures. It was the writs of assistance. It was James Otis that a man's house is his castle, and there's a reasonable amount of privacy that should come along with that. My point is that the Fugitive Slave Act was very, very unpopular throughout the North. It was especially unpopular in Boston. Now, I mentioned Rochester, I mentioned Madison, you could mention a lot of others. Cincinnati is another very good example, but they all paled in comparison to the abolitionism that, that was there in Boston. Boston, terribly, terribly important stop on the Underground Railroad. And you're looking at one of the reasons why. If you're following along with me in the PowerPoint, Lewis Hayden is one of those reasons as to why. We have this very innocent, but also misguided notion as Americans that when, when African Americans fled on the Underground Railroad, they fled into the outstretched hands of benevolent, good-hearted white people. I'm not saying that there weren't plenty of good white people to go around. There were that deeply resisted the institution of slavery. 
What I'm saying is, from a practical standpoint, this doesn't make a lot of sense because you're going to stand out. If you're the only African American in a room full of whites, you're going to give yourself away very quickly. And so more often than not, when blacks fled, they, they went to heavily concentrated African American communities, and Boston was one of them. Now, next to Lewis Hayden, you're looking at his residence there in Boston, which was an important stop on the Underground Railroad. Lewis Hayden was a former slave in his own right. He wasn't just any slave. Henry Clay, the designer of the Fugitive Slave Act, was also the owner of his wife and children. And Henry Clay, even though he was not a big fan of slavery, did own slaves. And he, he decided that he was just going to sell the wife and his child away. And it essentially destroyed Hayden's family. Hayden would later say, you know, he had two sons, one of which died. He said, I was always more comfortable with my son's death uh, because at least there was closure and I knew where he was. I could go visit his grave. I never had that closure with my other son. You know, I don't know after he was sold down the river what happened to him. I don't know how he was treated. I don't know anything, right? He's got a personal score to settle. Um, he's a runaway slave in his own right. He, he, he runs away. And get this, he actually had the audacity to reach out to his former master. He said, um, I am, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm taking my shot as a free man. I'm paraphrasing him, of course. He, he wrote to Mr. Bart, uh, uh, Bartlett. He says, I'm taking my chance, my shot as a free man. Um, I'm, I'm living here in Boston. Not only is he contacting him, which is a thumb in the eye to begin with, but he's actually saying, hey, if you need me, here's where I am. In other words, I'm underground, but I'm not so much underground, if you understand what I'm saying, right? It's a pretty bold thing to do. Slave catchers knew of Lewis Hayden, and they knew where he lived, but they also knew that this is not a guy that you mess around with. He's armed to the teeth, right? He's got pistols, he's got muskets, he's got knives, and he ain't afraid to use them. Let me give you a parting example. On one particular occasion, in the aftermath of the Fugitive Slave Act being passed, there was a slave catcher that showed up on the doorstep that you're looking at right there in Boston, and there were federal marshals that were there alongside them. And they said uh, something to the effect of, Hayden, we know that you got people in there, slaves in there, we're coming in. Hayden opens the door with a lit torch in his hand. I mean, that's an odd thing in and of itself. Even by the standards of the 1840s, that's odd. He says something like, well, if you guys are here with the feds, I guess you're coming in. But understand one thing, gentlemen. Understand that underneath the steps upon which you stand are several kegs full of gunpowder. I told you this guy's crazy. And understand that at my foot down here um, is the fuse that leads down to that dynamite. And I hold here in my hand a lit torch. I am not afraid to light that fuse. You take one more step, I'm dropping the torch, lighting the fuse, and I'm going to blow us all back to the Stone Age. I'm not afraid to do it. Just test me. If you want to see if I pass that test, take one more step. You gentlemen can either leave here in peace or you can leave in pieces. And as you might, might guess, they left in peace. Actually, they didn't, they didn't leave. They, they, they scurried away like cockroaches, right? So Lewis Hayden is a good example of the resistance of the Fugitive Slave Act, right? He's one of dozens and dozens of heroic stories of, of resistance. But Boston in particular had a notorious history, as far as the South is concerned, is on the one hand just completely not complying with federal law, like the Fugitive Slave Act, and on the other hand, um, being a place that slave owners were not very welcome. Um, Anytime there was a slave catcher in town, um, believe me, there, there, were, there were dozens and dozens and dozens of eyes uh, that all reported to this secret underground network that, that said, hey, you know, you're going to want to lay low. Um, we've, got, we've got company in town here. Okay, So we are reaching a point of no return. We're inching closer and closer to the Civil War. The Compromise of 1850 and the addition of California certainly nudges us further in that direction, but it's going to be the addition of more territory, in particular the Kansas and Nebraska territories, 
that you might even say push us over the edge of no return. And you'll see what I mean the next time we meet.